everyone. We have a really exciting morning, I think, planned for you. I want to get straight into our uh, panel discussion and our conversation and also leave time for your questions and also your contributions. Uh, the importance of capitalism and slavery is huge. It's been discussed for decades and decades. Um, uh, most people don't realize that the book was published in 1944, but Eric Williams was only 33 years old, which is a massive accomplishment for someone to write a work at that age and for us still be thinking about its relevance today. And, and I think that's very exciting for those young people that are in the room who might not realize that you can write a book at so young an age and it can make such an impact. I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Um, to my right, Carol Phillips is a St. Kitts-born British writer of fiction and non-fiction, winner of the 2013 Anthony Sabga Award for Caribbean Excellence, the Penn Open Book Award, and the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. His 1993 novel, Crossing the River, was, a short, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Dr. Heather Cato, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education at the UB St. Augustine, is co-editor of Capitalism and Slavery 50 Years Later, an excellent collection of essays, co-author of History in, of the Caribbean in the Atlantic World, and co-editor of Beyond Tradition, Reinterpreting the Caribbean Historical Experience, and Professor Selwyn Kujo, uh, is a professor of Africana Studies at Wellesley College and a TNT Express columnist. His most recent book is The Slave Master of Trinidad, William Harden Birdley and the 19th Century Atlantic World, long listed for the 2019 OCM Bocas Prize. Welcome, thank you all. So I'd like to start with um, a quote, actually a quote from Williams himself. He says, the West Indian historian of the future has a crucial role to play in the education of the West Indian people in their own history, and in the merciless exposure of the shams, the inconsistencies, the prejudices of metropolitan historians. So I'd like to start with asking my panelists, how do you think that this explains capitalism and slavery, this perspective of Williams, the genealogy in terms of Williams' education, the style and political intention of the book, and of course, its intellectual intervention. So you can take parts or you can take all. Um, and um, let me start in the middle and then move outwards. So Dr. Kato, I'll start with you. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I, I think the quote adequately captures Williams and his whole approach to history. Um, he really believed that historians had to be activists. He really believed in the potential of history to change. And his book really discusses a, a, a lot in terms of economic history, but it is more than that. It is a statement about the power of history and what history can do, how history can change the way we think, how we look at our societies, how we look at our, our communities. Um, he was talking to the well, I think he was talking to everybody, especially the people in the Caribbean, but he was also talking to the historians. And the very last sentence in the book speaks to historians and their role and their power. For Williams, the British had done it. They had used their historians to create their history. They had used them in commissions of inquiries. They were part of their whole system and, and defending their system. And he always saw that the role for Caribbean historians was to do exactly the same. So his battle against colonialism, against the ideology, was true history. And, and I think that is a mantle we must all take on and move forward with. What I wanted to do is you had asked us to prepare um, 
a, a, a relevant uh, paragraph or a few bits. And uh, I did that, and I'll come to your question. I was going to spend two minutes in trying to understand a book that, la a book that lasts for 75 years is not a pie in the sky or descriptive phenomenon. As we try to grapple with the importance of Eric Williams and the contribution of the text, and why it has lasted so long, together with James's Black Jacobins, which was republished for the 200th anniversary of the Haitian Revolution, there are two things I was concerned about. One, that uh, James, uh, Williams in his book grapples with the notions and the ideas of Adam Smith. That's where he starts. If you go to from page four to six, Adam Smith comes up. He's almost in dialogue with Adam Smith. Point one. Point two, as you remember, Adam Smith was not just an economist, he was also a philosopher. In, I think, 59, uh, he wrote something called Moral Sentiments before he did uh, The Wealth of Nations in 1775. In other words, Williams' book was not about stale facts and history. It was a philosophical attempt to understand a particular social phenomenon. Look at it, and you gave us the quote from below. So in other words, I think why the book has been so very important, what Williams did, what scholars have not done, they've looked at uh, the planter class, etc. They... They have looked at the planter class, etc. They have not looked at what the people did in chapter 12. And I think what Williams does, what he does, he empowers the voices of those below to say they are the ones in terms of history and organization, how the, the subaltern organizes and changes history. And what Williams was doing was trying to give voice to the voiceless and trying to say history is not the mere accumulation of facts. It's not simply the description of phenomena, but the interrogation of these basic categories, which makes that book so very important. I got one. I got one. Oh, Thank sorry. you. All right. Morning. Um, I, I wondered, I have a copy um, of the book here, and I wondered when I first read the book, and I opened it, um, and I saw that I bought the book in Bastyr in St. Kitts, in 1984, um, when there was a bookshop in Bastyr in St. Kitts. And I think it's really, I'm not a historian, but I think it's very important that I bought it at that moment. I didn't publish a novel until 1985, till the following year. And so much, I think, of the work done by my contemporaries, um, Caribbean writers, British writers, writers in the larger colonial world um, has been done standing on the shoulders of historians. Um, we've relied so much on historians to do primary research. And this book um, seems to me to be um, a foundation stone upon which we've all stood upon. It, it, it doesn't seem to me to be an accident that I read it the year before. I began to write or publish. Um, and one of the quotes that I carry around with me um, everywhere, all the time, and repeat to other writers and to students, is an Eric Williams quote, and it's very simple. He said, history, he said, <laughs> history is the basic science. Um, and I think that radiates through this book. Um, if we don't understand the past, if we don't understand the, the various forces that have shaped our past, we just cannot possibly understand the present. Um, and obviously it's a cliche, but it's true. If we have no understanding of our present, we have no possibility of shaping a future. So the book seems to me to speak more powerfully that, than any other history book I've ever read to the truth that history really is the basic science. Um, not just for us as social animals, but I think for us as writers too, um, particularly in a Caribbean context where so much of our history has been corrupted and corroded by others interpreting uh, our lives for us.
think that's an excellent point because so much of the creative writing that happens in the Caribbean draws on the histories that have been also documented and created by academics. And in fact, that's a really good model for those who are doing creative writing to also have a relationship with the, hist the historical material. But before I move on to some of my other questions, could you take a minute to just tell the audience a little bit about Williams also as the writer, because the book is in incredibly well written, incredibly t easy to read. It has irony. It has, you know, flair in, in phrases. Could you talk a little bit about that kind of personality that can also come through historical writing? Well, one, I don't think the book is easy to read. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's complex, and every time I read it, I see something else, because there's so many layers and so many levels. And, and he's excellent at weaving this together. So on one level, it's simple. It's the story and the rise and fall of sugar, and that's the story. On the other level, it is a complex development of about four very important themes. On yet another level, it's about societal change. And Williams, is, Williams managed to do that with simple language and, and take you along on this journey to self-discovery. So, so to me, it's extremely complex. Um, the power of his work, he's outraged at times, and, and it, it's, it's amazing, and the language he used. And on the other hand, Williams, I think, and we tend to forget this, is simply saying this is what the world is like. So you have those things going on at the very same time. So it's, it's multifaceted, and I, I think it could only come somebody from somebody like Williams when you look at someone born at that point in time under colonialism, early 20th century. Um, he was in Britain in the 1930s with all that fervor. He experienced the Caribbean, the United States, Britain, and he weaves all that together in this magnificent text, Capitalism and Slavery. Um, so, so I think we have to understand the man. We have to understand his background, his experiences. Um, coming from a colonial country, going to the colonizer, to the mother country, um, starting an academic career in a would-be colonizer. And, and, and I think that gave him a perspective to look at our history from unique lenses. His intellect allowed him to, to deal with it from so many different angles and, and to produce an, an outstanding text which has as much relevance in 2019 as it, as it did when he was writing it. Um, sorry. I think, as I, I think I want to join with Heather in terms of the simplicity book. I think, it's, I think I want to join with Heather in terms of the... It's simple in the sense that the writing is very lucid. But in terms of the ideas, as I said, he overthrew a lot of categories, and so therefore there are a lot of paradoxes. He says one thing, and then comes back and undercuts that in a sort of dialectical form. I just want to do one reading of one tiny, for example, the conclusions that Williams draws to show how in terms he was working at that dialectical level. Uh, uh, conclusion number one. After he realized he read the book, James looked at it and suddenly realized that it was too much of a description of phenomena. So he wanted to make sure that you know what the philosophical underpinnings of the work was. He says, the decisive forces in the period of history we have discussed are the developing economic forces. These economic changes are gradual, imperceptible, but they have an irresistible cumulative effect. And then he goes on to Marx. He says, men pursuing their interests are rarely aware of the ultimate results of their activity. The commercial capitalism of the 18th century developed the wealth of Europe by means of slavery. Of course, Europe was built over slavery and so on. But in doing so, it helped to create the, the industri industrial capitalism, first talk about manufacturing capitalism, it didn't create industrial capitalism of the 19th century, which turned wrong and destroyed again the dialectic, turned around and destroyed the power of commercial capitalism, slavery, and all its works. Without a grasp of these economic changes, the history of the period is meaningless. So what he's really saying, yes, he writes very simply, but he's working at certain kinds of categories, overturning them, checking them out, and saying the received wisdom is not what it should be. And if you say one of the, the, the important points of this, he's really going against received wisdom. 
Slavery is, uh, is abolished because of humanitarian reasons. No, no, no. Economics are primary. But then he goes back in that same, the second thing, and says, well, but we can't disregard the propagandic forces of will of force and others. So he's playing. I think what you, you, said, you, said is, um, you said is simple. But I think what is really getting at is that sort of dialectic interplay, one versus the other, etc., which makes it so very bright and which makes it so relevant today because it's the same kinds of forces we're dealing with. So he's a brilliant writer, that's quite true. But also, I think the ideas that undergirds and is challenging of received wisdom is, I think, what makes it such a very powerful text. Um, no, I just simply want to say that I thought of C.L.R. James when I was um, looking at the book again, simply because both uh, C.L.R. James and Eric Williams had a profound love of the English language. Oh, yes. And not every historian does have a profound love of the English language. Sure. Um, they are of a generation of Caribbean writer that felt um, a necessity to embrace the language and caress the language um, as part of their mission, whether they were historians or whether they were poets or, or novelists. And there's an eloquence and facility to the language in this book which, um, which Basically, we don't see in contemporary um, historical writing. The love language. You remember the part in uh, Inward Hunger when he says he goes for the first time to think tranquility of Kiasi and he encounters Latin and he goes home and Amor and he goes at language or languaging in terms of Carrington's uh, philosophy uh, pieces and is very important. And they're also coming out of a place where debating societies is the norm, where language is the way of coming to grips. So they love language, and of course, the, the mastery of language was a way to show their own intellectual superiority. That's the period they're coming out of. So um, uh, George Lamming describes Williams as a, Eric Williams as a historian, as an activist scholar. And I suppose my question to you about that is, would you agree that, with that? And we've been kind of touching on that. But also, how does this show us an example of history as a kind of activism, intellectual work of this era as a kind of activism um, that we don't often think about in terms of Williams because he has a reputation for being a nation builder, you know, that his work um, in, in the region and his impact comes through in terms of him setting up political systems and you know setting up a new independence model, but how in his intellectual thinking is he as much an advocate and an activism for a new independent way of seeing the country and also the region? He would say is that scholarship is not neutral. That scholars like Carol of us here are not members of any class. We are members of a strata. And the question, we don't produce anything. If we stop working, nobody give a heck. If the garbage workers don't pick up the garbage, we got some problems. So members of the intellectual class is really a member of a strata. And since we gain knowledge, the question is, what do we do with that knowledge? Do we use that knowledge in behest of the work of working people, or we don't? Point number one. Point number two. Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa is a great case of how one uses scholarship to advance it in kinds of political agenda. Williams does the same thing with British capitalism. So in other words, scholarship is never neutral. As scholars, as intellectuals, as members of a strata, we have said, whom are we working for? And Williams had it right. Williams, James, Padmo, all of those guys around that era. And their scholarship was in the aid of liberating their people, given that's why Woodford Square is so very important. He came back on the massive education because he understood George Lamin talks about Williams in Woodford Square. And that's why he used, he used his knowledge to liberate his people. Language, knowledge was a weapon in the struggle of liberation. After all, liberation is not only about arms. You've got to get the mind. And I think they were concerned about that. That's what Williams would mean by a, a scholar as being an activist. Since you don't produce nothing, we don't plant yam, we don't plant cassava, but of course we could use our scholarship to advance the cause of our group. Prof? Williams is, and, and with Williams we, we need to take, t think deeply about everything he says. And one of the things he says is that historians only play a very sh yes. small role in, in making and guiding history. 
And when we look at that and what Williams did, it's, it, it's, it's very ironic. He, he did both. He, he, he made history through the, his research and his thesis, and he also guided history. And uh, Williams is very clear that the role of a historian is to do exactly that. It is to be an activist. And, and uh, the power of the research is about getting us to understand ourselves. Now, when we think about when Williams was writing, when we think about the, this, if, if we want to call it Caribbean history, I still remember when I saw that we had a, a shelf in a bookstore in London for Caribbean history. And, and we don't realize how recent that is. And think about when Williams was writing. The, we, there was no context for our history. There was no voice. And he became that voice. And, 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 and that voice resonated not only in the Caribbean, but internationally. And, and, and we must understand that power. That is an activist. And I think sometimes as, as, as academics, um, we get caught up in research. But Williams will ask you, what is your research doing? Why are you doing it? It's useless decoration if it's bound and, and, and put there. How is this connected to your society? How do you use it to make a difference? And ultimately, that is what an activist is at its core. And, and I think it is very interesting that his work is still influencing us today in terms of our role in the Caribbean, in terms of how we write, in terms of the language we use, in terms of our thoughts. So I agree 100%. He is perhaps the ultimate um, scholar activist. But most important, I think the timing of his work is important. It's a watershed. When you look at writing before and Caribbean history writing afterwards, there's a qualitative difference. And I think Williams was pivotal to creating that difference. I, I think it's also um, important to think about where he was writing this book. Um, in the 1940s in Britain during the war, this Trinidadian black man was sitting in Oxford um, in the Rhodes House Library, undoubtedly the only black face in there, um, undoubtedly in a really difficult period of British history, um, the war, during the war thinking of the country he was going to go back to and thinking of what he wanted to take out of Oxford with him, what he wanted to take out of his education and bring it back to Woodford Square, eventually beyond Woodford Square. Um, to establish yes, to establish in UWE, to establish in um, much, um, which is an understatement in the Caribbean. But the, the, the genesis of this book came from isolation, loneliness, um, and sheer determination. Um, I think it's a huge understatement to say he was an activist. He was more than an activist. He was a visionary. Um, I think all scholars are activists, to be honest. I think you're an activist in a classroom, no matter what you're teaching. Um, part of your activism is to try to kindle the imaginations of the students in front of you. So I, I think all teachers and all scholars are activists, but I think of Williams as far, for, far, for, far more than just an activist. Um, I think of him as a, as a visionary. And as somebody who, the only time I've ever went into the Rhodes Library was just to feel what it was like for him. Um, and yeah. I was the only black face in there, of course. Um, and I'm sure if I did it now in 2019, it would probably be the same. But in 1944, it's, he had nerve and he had vision. Can we, can we talk a little bit about, for a moment, some of the limitations of the work given his focus. So he had a very strong focus on showing the economic determinants 
of the historical shifts of the period. You know, he traces the, the views of the humanitarians and shows how they shift back and forth. You know, one decade they're arguing something, another decade they're arguing something else, or 80 years one group that was arguing, the planters are arguing for not monopoly, then they're arguing against monopoly. It's much like our political system, actually. You know, one year you will advocate something when you're in government, and 10 years later you're advocating the opposite. Um, and so he's, he's tracing very much what's happening in terms of the economics of the period, the trade issues of the period. And it's only at the end of the book that he, he says, you know, I have not spent time on the question of emancipation from below. And that's fine, because that wasn't his main thesis in the book. But he begins to talk about how the enslaved Africans of the period had this conception of freedom that they were holding the British Empire accountable to, to accountable to, and every time the debates changed, or go, a governor would come, or anyone would come, they would insist that, in fact, this was another stage in holding the empire accountable for freedom that they felt they deserved. But he doesn't give it as much attention as later scholars may have, um, perhaps to fill in the gaps, or perhaps out of a different kind of focus. Can we talk a little bit about, you know, in? as the book has particular foci, what might be some of its limitations or the questions that it leaves for others to explore? I want to make the point that it's one book. I, I want to make the point that there are about three major themes and two themes that I call undeveloped. I want to make the point also that it's we who sat down afterwards and said, this is a theme and this is a theme and this is fully developed and this is underdeveloped. Williams had a master plan for what he was doing and why. And, and he set up to create an economic explanation as far as the humanitarians, which he felt their story was told. And he felt the Caribbean story was not told, and that was the story about the economics. With respect to the theme of emancipation below, it, it seems to be added in at the end of the book. But if you read the whole book, including the conclusion, the conclusion was the key. It weaves everything perfectly together. I don't see it at odds um, at all with the economic argument. And if, 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 if we add a new Marxist approach it and think about it, emancipation from the law, and, and when I look at the documents, I'm convinced the region was far more volatile than we were led to believe. Um, there was this notion that emancipation would be gradual. So over time, the enslaved people would become more civilized, and you, you would reduce, you would um, create new laws, and you will evolve at some unknown date to total freedom. What happened, however, is that the enslaved population was getting increasingly volatile, clearly showing that that approach was not going to work. So William says, emancipation from above or emancipation from below, but emancipation. So the action of the enslaved towards emancipation that was preempted with official emancipation from above. However, think about it and think about what Williams is seeing all along. It is economics. If they did not move to create emancipation from above, they would not have been able to maintain economic control. So ultimately, he's saying once more, the economics has won. Once more, they control the infrastructure and therefore will um, control the superstructure, and hence we have an Emancipation Act that does not speak anything about um, freedom and equality. It speaks about economics. So, 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 I, I don't see it at odds at all. I think if you read it and you connect it to the conclusion, it is the economic argument from another approach. It's a proletariat. Revolution is coming, and revolution has to be stopped because you have to maintain control of the economic system. Uh, putting on my literary shoes now, in terms of literary theory, we have a thing called intertextuality. Williams was writing in a vacuum. He was writing against Coupland who was in his committee who believed and prioritized and privileged the argument that slaves were free because of the humanitarian efforts of Wilberforce and others. William is saying that is not true. He's saying that the economic forces are the, uh, was the main driver in terms of primary causation 
of the emancipation of the slaves. So here you are, the head, the head of the committee is saying it's humanitarian reasons, and of course says, no, 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 it's economic reasons. Black boy at Rhodes, at Oxford, up against the major historian, have to have the kinds of evidences to almost overwhelm him. So the first thing to understand, it's intertextual. He's not writing just because he likes to write. He's writing against a dominant argument, which in point of fact, he must demolish. Because for all of us who do a doctorate, our doctorates and all that kind of stuff, if your boss men have a different idea, you better have enough evidence. So that was the first thing. So the book is not something to be seen in isolation. That's the first point. The second point is, so William's first thing was to deal with that argument. It was not humanitarian reasons, but it was economic reasons. Then at the end, now remember, Williams and James did this thing together. Uh, J, Williams at Oxford. James in 38 wrote the whole question of black Jacobins and says to Williams, I've, you, I've done it for the French Revolution. You must do the same thing for the British Revolution. So Williams begins to do that. And then the point when he gets up here, having demolished the humanitarian argument, he goes on page, uh, again, just very briefly, on slaves and slavery, and there we recognize, he says, da-da-da-da, uh, da-da-da-da. He says, we have, cons we, uh, we have considered the different attitudes of slavery of the British government, the British capitalist, and the absentee British West Indian planter, and the British humanitarians. I don't know that stuff, he says. It would be a grave mistake, however, to treat the question as if it were merely a metropolitan struggle or a metropolitan phenomenon. The fate of the colonies was at stake, and the colonists themselves were in a ferment which indicated, reflected, and reacted upon the great events in Britain. Then he says, first, there were the white planters who had, who did, who, who, who had to deal not only with the British parliament, but with the slaves. Secondly, there were the free people of color. And thirdly, there were the slaves themselves. Most writers of the spirit have ignored the slave. So having demolished, just in terms of the, the, the architecture of the work, having demolished the uh, humanitarian reasons, he goes and says, these are economic reasons. And now he says, you've been forgetting one thing. The role of the slaves, or the, you wouldn't say slave, you, say, you wouldn't say in slave, you said the slaves at the bottom and what they're doing. And that is what he must now work on. It's not so much a limitation. I think I said, I said quite rightly. You're writing one book. And I'm saying against the tort, and he's not just writing against Williams and the Caribbean. He's writing against a whole intellectual and historical uh, assemblage who have a particular view of the world. He must demolish that. He, when he goes to the exam and the, he makes a mistake in French, they laugh at him. He walks out. So here's a guy who's literally carrying that, the, 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 the scholarship on his shoulders and saying we must demolish it. And so therefore, it seems to me, to talk about, well, I'm sure it always works, always have limitation. I think while he comes and does those, those five pieces in the back, I think James may have read it and says, listen, you haven't made it very clear that it's, that it's not solely economics. That's why I began with moral sentiments from Adams. It's not solely economics. Economics is also con con uh, concerned with the question of philosophy. And then there's a part of which I want to go into when he talks about the whole role of reason, which he's now drawing on the French Enlightenment and the role of, of reason in the Enlightenment, again to Buttress's argument. So I think I would prefer to see it in intertextual terms, writing against a certain kind of phenomena and saying, my big task is to demolish it uh, in terms of the humanitarian thing, to do the uh, economic stuff, and say, well, I, you know, I really couldn't forget the role of the slaves. No, he doesn't develop it. Even though he could have, develop, could, have, could have developed a little more. But remember, he wrote the book in eight, it was his doctoral dissertation of 1838. The book comes out in 1844. He goes to all the... <laughs> oh, God, go make my life a what? Oh, God. <laughs> make my life a what? But then he goes, he goes to the Cuban library, he goes to Q, he goes and pick up more materials to develop the theme because he knows the argument lies in his marshal of facts, qua facts, to do what he has to do. Uh, well, okay, so one of the things I had asked our panelists is if there was a short paragraph in the book that they wanted to read to you all because we're here to celebrate good writing and um, the, the paragraph would have, may have had a particular significance. 
in terms of its in intervention, but also a particular beauty, because it is, it is such a well-written book. Um, and so can we start with, with that paragraph? And so I've asked them to read a paragraph to you all. So you can also hear them read from his work, those of you who may not have read the book, and then maybe talk a little bit about why they chose that paragraph, or that, or that passage, I should say. Um, I, ha I have uh, a short paragraph from the preface. Because I like prefaces. I like where people basically throw the gauntlet down and are just very clear about what it is they intend to do. So I, I like this paragraph, and then I'm going to say something about the very last line of the preface. In the middle of the preface, which is only two pages long, uh, Williams says, the book, however, is not an essay in ideas or interpretation. It is strictly an economic study of the role of Negro slavery and the slave trade in providing the capital which financed the Industrial Revolution in England and of mature industrial capitalism in destroying the slave system. It's therefore first a study in English economic history and second in West Indian and Negro history. It is not a study of the institution of slavery but of the contribution of slavery to the development of British capitalism. Um, I think it's really important to remember that because 75 years on in Britain, it's now taken as a complete truth that slavery financed the Industrial Revolution. There are TV programs being made about it. There's documentaries being made about it at the time Williams wrote that paragraph, he was pushing against a huge degree of ignorance and misunderstanding. So part of the achievement of the book, I think, is that I don't think there's anybody in Britain who now doesn't understand the relationship between slavery and the great Georgian terraces in Bath and the architecture of the city of London and Bristol and so forth. Um, obviously, there are people who don't understand that, but it is part of the national narrative now, and it's part of the curriculum. So um, I, I'm particularly struck by that paragraph. The second page of the preface is, begins, many debts must be acknowledged, and Williams lists every library he worked in, he lists every grant that he got, he lists every fellowship, and then the very last line he says, finally, my wife was of great assistance to me in taking my notes and typing the manuscript. Um, I don't think so. I think he's got to do a bit better than that. I love the conclusion. Um, I find it um, totally unexpected. I, I, I think after um, developing three major theses, you expect him to conclude about those things, or con conclude, see more about um, sugar and, and in, enslaved people. But his, his conclusion is, is totally different. And I just want to read some, some excerpts. He refers to ideas and principles for the examination of what is going on around us today. Um, and uh, one, this is his conclusion. The decisive forces in the period of history we have discussed are the developing economic forces. Two, the various contended groups of dominant merchants, industrialists, and politicians, while keenly aware of the immediate interests, are for that very reason generally blind to the long-range consequences of their various actions, proposals, policies. Three, the political and moral ideas of the age are to be examined in the very closest relation to the economic development. Four, an outworn interest whose bankruptcy smells to heaven in historical perspective can exercise an obstructionist and disruptive effect 
which can only be explained by the powerful services it had previously rendered and the, in, the, and the entrenchment previously gained. And fifth, the ideas built on these interests continue long after the interests have been destroyed and work their mischief, which is all the more mischievous because the interests to which they correspond no longer exist. We have to guard and to not on, sorry, we have to guard not only against these old prejudices, but also against the new, which are being constantly created, no age is exempt. The points made above are not offered as solutions of present-day problems. They are noted as guideposts that emerge from the charting of another sea which was in its time as stormy as our own. The historians neither, guide, neither make nor guide history. Their share is such is usually so small as to be almost negligible. But if they do not learn something from history, the activities would be cultural decoration or a pleasant pastime, equally useless in these troubled times. So he brings the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, right up to our present times. And I think here he's speaking to us. It captures his style, it captures his philosophy, it captures his purpose for writing, and it captures what he wants to leave us with. And I think it's the key to understanding the entire text. Okay, I'll be very short. Uh, Williams is just writing for the Caribbean, he's writing for Britain. That last thing you talk about those old outmoded forces with hold back progress is exactly what's happening in Brexit. Brexit. A new one has dawned, but a whole economic order who have no sense of what's going on, in fact, is holding back the movement. In other words, William was not just writing for us, he was writing also for Britain. Second point, and I'll make it very short. Uh, it goes back to where I think I began, and probably it would be nice to sort of. I'm very concerned about the role of the folks from underneath, the Bolton, as it were, who in fact are driving progress. And I think this chapter really captures, he does not do the development as you would have liked him to have done it, but I think he makes it very clear. He says, uh, uh, I read the first part, but he said first there were the, the, the forces that in fact were, which people have dealt with and which we have not dealt with. He says, we have considered the different attitudes to slavery, of that the British government, the British capitalism, the absent British West Indian planter, and the British humanitarian. We have followed the battle of slavery in the home country. It would be a grave mistake, however, to treat the question as if it were merely a metropolitan struggle. It's also a Caribbean struggle. The fate of the colonies was at stake, and the, and the colonials themselves were in a ferment with which indicated, reflected, and reacted upon the great events in Britain. First, there were the white planters who had to deal uh, not only with British Parliament, but with the slaves. Secondly, there were the free people of color. And third, there were the slaves themselves. Most writers of this period have ignored them. Modern historical writers are gradually awakening to the distortion which is the result of this. In correcting the deficiency, they correct an error which the planters and the British officials and politicians of the time never made. And of course he goes on. But the important point is I think in terms of Williams and the role of the people was very important. One last point and I'll end. I'm just gonna, there's not a plug for my book. It is a plug for my book. <laughs> but um, the one thing that Williams kind of make very clear is that uh, when one looks at slavery as a dialectical phenomenon, you can't understand slavery if you only talk about the slaves. You must talk about the planter class and their role. Black Reconstruction by Du Bois begins with the role of the planter.
James's black Jacobins, the role of the planters. In other words, if you only look at the official discourses and the officials, what they're doing in London and Britain, you will never understand the phenomena. And Williams understood only too well, and that's why I think he began to say, okay, I've made my case, now let's switch to see what the people, the ordinary people doing in terms of the revolts, etc. So my last question before, <laughs> before we open to the floor, um, which we can answer briefly, is, you know, at, when a book is 75 years old, it passes through multiple generations. And each generation reads something within the context of its time. So if you are reading this book in the independence period, or if you're reading it in the 1970s, or if you know, these are all very, very different cultural and historical frames. The ideas circulating are very different. And so, I mean, all of you teach. You teach another generation. Um, and so you know that we have to convey long established ideas to, um, to upcoming thinkers in ways that somehow connect them to both history and to the present. And, you know, the question of reparations has come up again in the last decade in an extremely powerful way, including tracing again the money, um, the wealth that came out of emancipation, tracing it in multiple directions, even uh, what many don't know is how much the payments to the planters um, went on to fund uh, indentureship all over the world and plantations, rubber plantations, plantations all over Southeast Asia, you know, reestablishing that money was used to finance a second economic order around unfree labor in a, in a different kind of way. But what do you see as, as the book's relevance today? Even for me reading it, it was a reminder how often we have to understand the global political economy all the time. So you might be looking at, at struggles that are happening in one country or in one place, but if students aren't able to connect it to what's happening on a global scale, sometimes they're missing all kinds of other dynamics in the framework. In another way, when I was reading it and I was hearing how politicians um, in the parliament and the House of Lords and others would be switching back and forth, the humanity, and Williams pays a lot of attention to silences. He'll say the humanitarians would say this, this, and this, but they were silent on the question of, of all of these other things, you know? They wanted abolition, but they weren't actually interested in, in um, land redistribution and all kinds of questions that enslaved um, workers, enslaved Africans, were themselves concerned with, and, and justice. Um, so it highlighted to me as well, even in the small scale of our own Trinidad politics, you know, we, we think that this idea of switching discourses back and forth, back and forth is specific to us or specific to politicians, but it's the interplay of politics and, his, and, and economics and politics and vested interests, and it's a reminder to pay attention to that even as you know, current corruption issues are happening in our midst as well. So these are just, you know, when I was reading it and I'm thinking about this moment, I'm like, gosh, this reminds me that all of these are, are much longer historical trends. And what, how would you connect this book to the present um, for a younger generation to, to want pick to up, pick it up and, and see it as relevant to their own world today? Start with any of you. I will say um, unfinished business um, in two senses, I think in an academic sense and in a philosophical sense. Um, it is very easy to make the connection and, and I, I really do have much trouble doing it. Um, so when writing your book, Capitalism and Slavery, came back. I was doing an article about Caribbean Connecticut, Connecticut um, connections, Capitalism and Slavery came back. Um, I want to say in terms of the academic debates, they are still going on. Um, in, in, in fact, the most recent thing is that there may have been a second commercial revolution caused by the, um, com by the compensation money that we are now looking at. So, so that academic discussion is ongoing and a new generation of historians are contributing to that. On the philosophical sense, I think we have to admit um, we have not come as far as we should have. Looking at the United States, I think things we felt were settled 
are even more unsettled than we anticipated. When we look at the, the, some of the latest writings, they are coming from the US. People looking at the southern United States and applying Williams' theory directly because they're trying to understand what is going on. After the period of Obama, you felt things were settled. Trumpism now questioning how enslavement is viewed, the debates over statues, that has led them directly to capitalism and slavery. And we have a slew of studies, um, 2013, 14, 15, 16, applying these same theories to the United um, States. So as we try and understand ourselves, understand our history and how that history impacts and how we are now, capitalism and slavery is becoming increasingly relevant, not decreasing in importance at all. And I think it is because we have unfinished business. Every generation writes a history or shapes a history connected to their needs, and I think that is exactly what is happening with capitalism and slavery. Uh, just two questions. I am a Eric Willem fella. Woodford Square is at the side. And my book on Williams, I remember I bought uh, the history of the people are trying to be go in 1962, when he says you cannot go into independence without having your own history. Louis, the book was how much? A dollar? Yeah, no, you didn't buy it then, Louis. But cap the book, History of People of Tobago, was a dollar. Williams was the one. I didn't go to the nice uh, QRC and all the brilliant places. My education took place in Woodford Square. Here in Williams speak from one end of the country to another. The book I knew and loved, even though I know uh, Bridget have all kind of problem with it, the history of Prevention of Bago, is one of those things that was very important to me. So Williams was very real. Capitalism and slavery, I think, is, was very important because like I think one of the other panelists says, it made me understand the sort of international dimension of uh, trade and understanding moving from what we call manufacturing capitalism to industrial capitalism and the whole role of, uh, the whole role of, of uh, 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 slavery in building up these both France and all, all that kind of good stuff. As, of course, James says, if you don't understand that, you have no understanding of what's going on in terms of the world and how the world was developed. So the continued relevance, I think, of James, of Williams' capital and slavery is when uh, Catherine Hall and the, the legacy, slave legacies as UCL, when they launched that thing, Catherine Hall, uh, and she began by quoting capitalism and slavery and talking about the, in, the in terms of trying to understand where the monies went and who's doing what and the, the relevance of Williams' thesis. She began with Eric Williams and quoted from it. So I would simply end by saying, I think it's a the note I'd sort of made to myself and it just goes to Williams's argument, which I think remains perpetually evergreen. Williams's argument was that slavery helped make modern Britain, and at the same time, underdeveloped the Caribbean, Walter Rodney's argument prior to, etc. He argued that the contribution of slavery to building even Britain and immiserating the Caribbean, both at the level of economy and to some level of cultural associations and dispossession remains very true. Those are exactly the arguments which CARICOM reparations claim is based. At the same time, Williams's history of reparative, of reparative history in the dual sense that he recovers the historical significance of the enslaved people and, the re, and reinscribes slavery into the history of Britain itself. Prior to, it did not exist. So Williams' continuing legacy is he makes us think about the correlation between underdevelopment and development, between Britain's development and our development, and the notion that unless we repair, it goes into reparation, unless we repair that damage and say, how are we going to solve that problem, we'll have continuing problems. And Williams' work remains the guidepost in terms of how we could begin to tend to that, those, that continuing problem of our own dispossession. Um, yeah, just briefly, I think we're all um, somewhat uh, somnambulant consumers of, or recipients of the benefits of capitalism. We don't think about it. Um, and when I was reading the book, uh, again, I kept looking at the title and 
reading and then looking at the title. Capitalism um, is the more important word for me. And I think everybody who has an iPhone should think about capitalism. You know, um, I'm going to completely, I'm going to open it up to the audience, but on a completely different area, you know, Arundhati Roy's essay, Capitalism, A Ghost Story, um, which you can find open access, is a kind of, to me, when I read it, I read, you know, she's tracing the whole history about how capitalism comes to affect the daily, daily lives of tribal peoples, indigenous peoples, workers, and so on in India. And it's this thesis that comes back again and again. So I'd like to open it up to the audience now. I'd like to hear your own opinions and um, disagreements and debates. So the floor is open for questions as well. Introduce yourself, Naprof. Sure. Um, Bridget Barrington um, from UWI St. Augustine. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists. I think the, um, your perspectives on this important book were very valuable. All of you um, particularly focused on chapter 12, the famous last chapter of Capitalism and Slavery, in which William speaks about the role of the enslaved and particularly resistance in bringing about emancipation. Plus, and I completely agree with Selwyn, that we have to bring black Jacobins in, into the discussion. Really, chapter 12 in Capitalism and Slavery and Black Jacobins coming out within the same few years, um, they really pointed towards the way Caribbean historiography would develop in the next 75 years. Because if you think about it, um, the main project behind the writing of Caribbean history in the last 75 years has been the project to restore agency to the enslaved and the ex-enslaved, to the indentured and the ex-indentured, and everybody living in the Caribbean. So I wonder if you could, um, the panelists could comment on the way in which these two great books really did um, set the agenda for 75 years of scholarship about Caribbean history. And now I think about it, Caribbean creative writing too, because much of the project behind Caribbean creative writing has also been to restore agency to the people who lived in the Caribbean. So I don't know if the panelists might comment on that. Thank you, Gabriel. Good morning, everyone. Julian Matthews, UB St. Augustine. I'm asking the question now. Uh, thank you very much, panelists, for your insightful reflections on capitalism and slavery. Uh, my comment slash question is for Professor Kujo. Uh, I'm a bit uncomfortable with your use of the word demolish in reference to what Eric Williams did with the humanitarian argument that existed prior to his own interpretation of abolition from the economic perspective. Um, in my reading of the book, I felt that what he did with the humanitarian argument was put it in its right perspective and consequently widened and significantly revised the historiography that was in existence at the time. So I was wondering if you would be willing to reconsider whether the word demolish is most appropriate in terms of what Williams did with the humanitarian argument put forward by Klintberg and Kuplan, et cetera. Thank you. Don't you love academics? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Not so much a question, but really two things uh, struck me in the discourse, which I have never made a connection with before. And uh, they are non-academic things. In fact, two events which provided a lot of material and continue to provide a lot of material for the academics uh, to write about. Maybe it was sitting in the shade of the Red House. What was that? Uh, 40 years or so before Williams and James got writing about revolutionary thinking 
of our past. The people of Port of Spain burned down the damn building because the, the, the council of the day wanted to charge them for things they were not getting and they were not going to stand for that. And then in the 1930s, Butler and Rienzi and company saying, we don't accept this economic order, this economic and inhuman order, that is, to use Selwyn's word, I, I don't know if you'll rethink it after, demolish <laughs> the people of the area, uh, the people yeah. of, of, of Faisabad and Separia and, and so on. So here were two events by people on the ground, not by people who were, benefit, were beneficial or beneficiaries, sorry, of the education system and writing in that academic way, but providing the activity for the historians uh, to write about afterwards. Any other questions from the audience? Don't be intimidated. Anybody under 25? Is <laughs> 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 serious? Yeah. <laughs> let me um, let me um, deal with Bridges Point. I, I agree 100%. Um, if I were to add to that group, I would add Rodney um, in, in, in terms of really pivotal and, and um, introducing a change really in the historiography and, and uh, a, a focus on agency. I think it has led to a, a, a reshaping of, of, of uh, almost every major dimension in, 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 in Caribbean um, history. From my own work on, on um, plantations, it, um, it has really um, led me to reinterpret the nature of activities on, 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 on a plantation and, and the extent to which the enslaved population impacted on, um, I have to be careful of using the word, quote, 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 empowered, but, 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 but it leads to a different reading of, of, of Caribbean history and a different understanding of, of what, what went on. I think today we write history with a lot more nuance. I think we've moved from absolutes to, to, to a, a more in-depth in, in discussion. And if I were to apply that to Williams' work um, and, and, and reading it several times, um, I, think, I think he had a purpose. He placed emphasis in certain areas. But every now and again, he warns us about the, uh, a unicausal explanation. Or he warns us uh, um, uh, um, to, not to disregard the humanitarians. Um, 100%, and, and I think we have to understand that to, 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 to fully look at any entity, we need all, look at it in all its dimension, the economic, the political, the social, from all levels. And, and that is important, and it's powerful to really understand it. However, we also need to zero in our focus on certain areas because that gives a kind of understanding that you cannot get by looking at the whole. And, and, uh, and, and I think at this point in time, we're trying to de develop that balance between the two, this holistic perspective, but getting that kind of in-depth understanding. In the case of William Sue, I, I want to point out that he was interested in what made the movement successful and it's different from just describing what went on, economic, political, social, but he's saying what really led to emancipation, and hence his focus on that particular area. However, I, I do agree, um, one of the things I would love to do, and I'm thinking of John Campbell's work here, is to, is to look at the relationship between Williams and, um, and James. And, and, and that beginning from curiosity and those beginnings and developing um, in, while they were in Britain and, and that impacting on his work. I think James did influence Williams, especially the, the, the second part of the book. And, and, and I think the three of them, Rodney, James, and Williams, um, helped shape anew 
Caribbean history, which is still evolving? Well, the three inaugurated a new break. You want to call it the epistemological break, and then people the, who do the literary theory calls it. Remember, forget the school that's curious is fine. James goes, no, 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 I don't mean it in a derogatory way. James goes up in 1938, he writes Capitalism and Slavery. When I interviewed him, he said simply that. He says, Williams, I've done X, Y, I've for the French Revolution and show you how capital did whatever it did. You could do the same thing for uh, the uh, British Revolution. And then there was a study group of which Walter Rodney was a part of the study group, him and Patterson and so on, with C.L.R. James. So it's a whole kind of grouping who are beginning to think in a different way. However, it doesn't help, or certainly it helps, to see history as part of a larger movement. James Wright, the Spanish War, when James Wright, the first, in 1838, the Spanish War is taking place. His last chapter, you go see it, is about that. He changed it when he came around. Williams writes in 18, uh, oh God, 1890, oh God, this 1944, but remember the other currents of history. The Bandung Conference is important of 1954. The liberation in terms of Azikawe in Nigeria and Kwame Nkrumah in Nigeria, and the whole, oh, that whole movement when they meet in London, James and all of those guys, Spadmore, it's a whole change. Not that Williams is somebody out there doing this wonderful thing, you know. Williams is part of a larger historical current. So his work reflects that change. And that change has taken place politically in terms of the dawning of a new day, a different way of seeing the world, the rising. When you go to Azikawe, you go to Kwame Nkrumah, what you really have is a new way of the ordinary people being in, not even so much empowered, but coming into their own. That helps us to begin to re settle or rechange the dialectic. It's no longer about those kings and queens, etc. Almost like you know, when we just talk about you know, the divine rights of kings, and then you have, of course, the, the American Revolution, then you have the French Revolution, and you have the empowerment of the ordinary people. And what that does, say the band down, that ordinary people, 10 minutes, okay, are coming into being. And I, so I think, Barrett, apart from that, what he does, it's really important because it's also part of a large historical era where the ordinary people, in the words of the subaltern, is important. Uh, the second point which I, I, I wanted to make, I'm thinking of Jose Mati. And Jose Mati in our America, I remember that a wonderful uh, article by Retama, when he talked about our America coming out of Cuba. And uh, what he talks about is the fact that, sorry, I, I, I've even a sorry, you know, because I know it's your field, so don't uh, jump on me. But what he did say, for example, that unless you control your culture and your literature, Jose Mati, you do not have. You can't have uh, dominion over your national culture. Unless you control that, Jose Mati, our America. And I think what is happening here, once the historical draft is changed, even that begins to affect your fiction and your history and your writing of history, even your writing of history. So Laming says, I think as the natives of my person, give me the literature, you keep everything else. Give me the mind. And I'd handle it. So I think, in terms of also the history and the literature, it's affected by this new way. So it's an epistemological break. And I think of it as Althusser, I think. And so what you have is a new way of looking at the world. And I think that's what it inaugurates. Walter, later on, James, of course, and others. Of course, people like Said will come on later. Sorry. Oh, one last thing. Retro retrospective readings. <laughs> I am sorry about the demolishing, but that's what he did, boy. He messed the thing up. He mashed it up <laughs> in Zimbabwe. <laughs> sorry. Yes. I, I, I just wanted to say that, that if we look at Caribbean history, um, whether it's the enslaved population, whether it's endangered servers, whether it's the working class, whether it's the, the, the masses, they have always had a, a major impact on the course of major developments. And, and, and I, I, I think that is very interesting 
um, we can we, we, we can write our history looking at slave revolts, um, 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 resistance, and, and um, issues in the 1930s, and, and, and come straight up, I think, to current day, and, 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 and write a history of resistance, write a, uh, uh, a history of people looking for themselves, finding themselves, and write a, a, a history of people who have been able to influence what has happened at the, at, at the political level through agitation, through organization at, at the, the level of the masses. And, and I think that is imp an important part of our history and something we should be proud of. Is it on? My name is Joan Osborne. The, I wish to congratulate and to thank the panel and really to thank Boca Slit Fest for this undertaking that continues from after nine years. My deepest concern is that capitalism and slavery, 75 years old. The moderator did ask whether there was anyone 25 years and under in this room, or anyone that age, and no. But well, they're here. They're here? Yeah. Yeah. One or two? Well, but history, my deepest concern is that the bulk of our, of these children passing through the school system is not exposed to this information at all. And I just want to know what can we do to change that? It is, it is very disheartening. Okay, so thanks. We just there's a hand over there. Any others before? And it's our last last round. So, sister in the back, and young brother in the front. Hi, I'm 25. So <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to jump in. It's a political act. To, you ask to give space to young people. Yeah, I just wanted to um, respond to that. I mean, it's my concern too. Uh, part of part of what I'm hearing and my own. I, I read this book for Cape and for CSEC, parts of it. Um, and in my memory and in my re-encountering of the book, uh, it feels like the undercurrent is about how capitalism really found its stride in the abuse of the black body and the black and brown body. So I feel like in many ways when we talk about it, it's 75 years old and we keep re-encountering it partially because that abuse hasn't ended. And so I'd really like for... Um, us to think more about and maybe even talk about the ways in which um, those systems of exploitation continue um, and the ways in which we ourselves and our own government um, has been like, what do you call that? What's that again? Complicit? Yeah. Complicit in, in um, those systems of exploitation. Uh, and yet yeah, to go off your point, I'm, I'm concerned too about about like the common knowledge of it, you know what I mean? Not even like children passing through schools, but like um, young adults everywhere, you know, um, in Trinidad, about our knowledge of ourselves within these systems of exploitation, yeah. So that's our last comment for the, and then our panel's a wrap. Carol, we haven't heard from you. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say that the, I think it's very important to hear what you just said because capitalism um, in the context of this book was a parasite feeding on the exploitation of black and brown bodies but capitalism feeds on the exploitation of bodies and you should google the people that make those cell phones and make those iPhones and see the exploitation of the workers in China um, you could look all around you and see the way in which capitalism is a parasite continuing to exploit uh, peoples of many races and many different ethnicities and backgrounds today. That's a lesson that I think that uh, Williams would want us to take from this book. In that sense, go beyond slavery and think about the um, ongoing rampant effects of capitalism. And, and to this lady's point here, um, I'm not, I, I mean, I, I can't talk about Trinidad, obviously, but history should be the first 
subject on every curriculum. Um, that should be the first subject. And a love and an, an understanding of history has formed the bedrock of the literature that has been produced by my generation of writers and the writers that um, I consider to be my fellow travelers, whether it's Australian writers, um, Indian writers, whether it's Peter Carey, whether it's Salman Rushdie, whether it's uh, Wale Shoyinka or Jinwa Achebe, all of these writers have a profound relationship to history and it's in their literature because part of their mandate as writers in a colonial, and Derek, obviously, Walcott, um, part of their mandate has been to write themselves into visibility, and they've needed to lean against history in order to do that. So um, I'd like to wrap this panel. Um, uh, thank our presenters. Please put your hands together for our presenters. <laughs> We've been able to reflect on how the, um, the books that are written reflect the genealogies and life of the writers, their own intellectual experiences, the debates and the politics of the time, and um, those with whom they have very significant quarrels with and proceed to write in order to engage with those, and, um, and the ways that they, they are trying to place themselves in a world in which they, um, they choose the conditions in which we also, um, that that world, um, they create the conditions of the world also for us, for others. Um, and I invite you all, I know the book is probably on sale uh, outside from the booksellers, so I want to encourage you all to purchase books and, um, and to stay around for the, for the next panel. So thank you all very much.